Hello, and welcome to this episode of The Road to Intelligent Data Apps on the Cube. Today, we're going to dig deeper into data lakes and how composable data lakes should be and can be, and what is possible with them. We'll also discuss how the personas are changing, especially with AI driving in a whole nother set of workloads that are also influenced by the traditional workloads that are still there that are analytics and operational data stores and things of that nature. So we're gonna really dive into this. I'm Rob Streche, Managing Director with the Cube Research, and I'm joining George Gilbert on this, his pod uh, to really help dig in here. Uh, George is leading this research into what's going on in data lakes, how all of this comes together, the governance, the metadata, how it all ties together. So I really appreciate George letting me on here. Uh, but we're also graced with the presence of Justin Borgman, who's the CEO of Starburst, who's really going to help us bring some perspective from the customers that he's talking to that Starburst is talking to and how he sees the industry changing. So we're really excited to bring you on board, Justin, and thanks for having me on, George. Good to have you, Rob. Thanks for having me. So let's kind of start with personas because I, I think to me, you know, being a product guy, it, it really kind of pays out a little bit when you think, you know, working backwards from that customer. You know, what is kind of the value that you see or you're hearing about for multi-vendor or composable data platforms, uh, you know, to the different personas that are out there that have to work with the data and, you know, really dig into analytics products. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think the, the end um, uh, beneficiaries of these technologies are ultimately data analysts, business analysts, data scientists who want to perform analytics on their, their data sets. Um, but very often it's data engineers who are operating these systems and have to, you know, contend with their interoperability or lack thereof. Uh, and, and so, you know, what we focus on is really trying to make it as easy as possible for that data engineer persona to, to uh, leverage the power of the platform. Yeah. Um, you know, I'll also mention that uh, another persona that's always important in our uh, sales cycles is uh, the CIO or the CTO, who is very often the uh, economic buyer of our, our solutions for the simple reason that from their vantage point, uh, they care about lock-in, they care about costs, they care about the scaling of those costs and ensuring that their data management costs do not scale faster than the revenue of their business itself. Uh, so they're also an important stakeholder. So Justin, talking about two of those personas that you mentioned, if the economic buyer now feels they have more leverage over vendors because of this separation of computers and um, data, you know, with open data formats like Iceberg and a choice of engines like Starburst. So the economic buyer feels they have more leverage, but how does that impact that, that persona that you mentioned that is often, you know, that faces the interoperability um, hidden tax, if there is one, what does that tax look like if, if any, and and how do you help um, you know the data engineer get around that, around that? Yeah, that's an excellent question. You're you're absolutely right. You know, I think that the intuition that you're pointing to is that uh, the the leverage that the economic buyer has is really only as strong as the true interoperability of those components. And it is often the data engineer who is stuck with uh, ensuring that these different components actually do work together. And so I think you have to pay extra attention to the various components that you're choosing and just how interoperable they'll be. So that's everything from the open format, as you described, and I'm sure we'll talk about Iceberg at some point in this in this podcast, but also you know things like catalog, uh, the query engine itself, um, and you know the rest of the data ecosystem that's going to integrate with these technologies. And I think you'll see that many of the vendors have their own proprietary solutions uh, and, and others have more open solutions. And so you really want to prioritize open solutions to, to maximize for the interoperability. So yeah, I, I think that to me actually is a good segue into this because folks like Databricks and others are claiming, you know, again, all along they've had open with Delta tables and Delta Lake and been here and, you know, 
really embracing standards. So how, how do you see that kind of come together with the fact that Iceberg has emerged and you have, you know, Delta sharing is still there and people in our research, uh, about 70% of organizations uh, through the ETR research that we've seen really look at things like Iceberg and Delta as kind of the really they're where they're aiming you know they're kind of moving away from hootie and things like that but delta and iceberg are still there how did do, how does that really jive with that with what is really open yeah excellent question and i think this was a huge summer frankly in the industry you know i i jokingly call it the summer of iceberg that we just <laughs> made it through here uh and, and that's because iceberg really established itself now i think definitively as that industry standard that open standard uh and that was achieved really by two major events that happened over the summer first and foremost snowflake decided to ga their support for accessing snowflake i mean accessing iceberg uh tables uh which was a big deal so here you have the proprietary cloud data warehouse now embracing an open format in a meaningful way and then simultaneously you had databricks uh also actually uh, acquiring or acquiring the creator of iceberg and saying that they too now will support the iceberg table format so suddenly this sort of contentious format war was essentially resolved in the span of a month or two uh by all of the major vendors you know snowflake databricks and, and ourselves if i may say so uh supporting the iceberg standard and so i think that really solidifies uh, iceberg as the format and the foundation of creating a composable and interoperable uh, data platform. So, Justin, let's 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 dig into that a little bit. Um, so many accounts have both um, Databricks and Snowflake. Um, often, Databricks came in for the the data engineering, you know, pipelines and the data science, and Snowflake was for the um, business intelligence, um, and that meant. You know, if, if they were supporting an open format on the Snowflake side, it's it's really managed iceberg. If you're getting the full functionality, or or you know, fully open iceberg, if you have read-only access from from Snowflake, but then you have Delta tables on the Databricks side. So now a customer comes in and says, "Okay, I want to, you know, my my data transformation workloads and my ingest are half my Snowflake spend. I want to bring that down," and they and they talk to you. How do you yeah. fit into that landscape? Yeah, that's exactly where we want to fit. Um, I, I think in order to ensure interoperability between these platforms, uh, you need uh, an open and independent way of managing and governing these iceberg tables in the first place. And so where we've invested a lot, uh, and maybe just a quick refresher for, for your listeners, uh, of course, Starburst is the company behind the Trino open source project. Trino came out of Facebook. It's how Facebook and LinkedIn and uh, and uh, Netflix and so many of the leading internet companies, uh, Apple and, and Twitter and so forth, do their data analytics, their SQL analytics, their sort of data warehousing style analytics. Uh, and very often they do it in a lake. Uh, and of course, Trino also allows you to federate and access other data sources as well. So that's our heritage. That's our pedigree. We're the creators of that Trino project. Uh, my co-founders are. And uh, what's noteworthy, I think, is when Netflix first created the Iceberg format, some of the first queries ever run on Iceberg were actually uh, Trino queries or Presto, as it was known before back then. Uh, and so that pairing in the open source community between Trino and Iceberg is basically as old as Iceberg itself. Uh, and so we see so many high profile users, some of the names that I just mentioned, that have pushed this combination to the nth degree of scale, to, to thousands of concurrent queries and petabytes of data, uh, truly to, to the limits. Uh, so I think for us, what we bring to bear is a leading uh, query engine, and we provide an enterprise version of that, which has better performance, better security, and a whole bunch of extra features. But we've also invested more recently in the end-to-end -end management of those iceberg tables. And that's what's new or newer for Starburst, I would say, in the past 12 to 18 months, is we've added ingest capabilities. So you can now create your iceberg tables. And in fact, we just um, made GA uh, something called streaming ingest, where you can actually connect to a Kafka stream, for example, and we'll automatically turn those into iceberg tables. Uh, so you've got your 
managed iceberg tables uh, right out of the gate. In fact, we've tested that up to 100, gigab 100 gigabytes per second. So it can handle you know enormous scale of, of ingest. We've also added things like compaction and all the data maintenance aspects of iceberg. And the reason this is so important both to us and in our view to the industry is that this allows you to create a genuine data warehouse, if you will, based on iceberg. We like to call that the ice house, if you will, the iceberg you know, lake house. Uh, and and, and that's, that's what's so exciting. And the beauty, again, is if you're storing in an iceberg, you have the choice, as you alluded to, George, where you can access that through, through Databricks, you can access that through Snowflake, and you're no longer locked in to one proprietary storage. So, so, so what becomes... Sorry, let me, Rob, let me just follow up on that one thing, which is what becomes the, the governance source of truth? The, the, for first for the metadata, the technical metadata, which is, you know, which of the parquet row groups, whatever, become, you know, are part of this table. Yep. But then the, the broader governance metadata permissions and ultimately lineage, like, because you've got some, some of that in Snowflake, you've got some of that in Databricks Unity, you've got some of that in, in your catalog. Where does that all come together? Yeah, so I think the key here, kind of back to your opening point around interoperability and, and leverage for the, the end customer, is uh, we need to give customers options. We need to give them the flexibility to decide how they're going to do exactly what you described. And you're right that each of the vendors has a solution, but at least our approach all along has been to really maximize optionality for our customers. So for example, you could choose to purchase a Muta uh, which is a third-party, you know, uh, ABAC uh, access control provider, uh, and we can leverage their policies, for example. Or you might choose to use, you know, the open source Ranger project, or uh, you know, the company uh, Privacera. There are a number of different uh, vendors out there that you can choose from, and we'll leverage that uh, from an access control perspective. Similar uh, situation around catalogs, being able to access multiple different types of catalogs. Of course. There's the Hive Meta Store, which has been around forever. Not necessarily the best catalog, but it's probably the oldest catalog in this space. Uh, but we also allow you to connect to, you know, Blue Catalog in AWS, or uh, now the Polaris catalog. And actually, I think Polaris is a very interesting development as well, coming out of this summer, where Snowflake, which has historically been the the you know most proprietary vendor in the space, has now actually uh, taken a very open approach with their catalog. And in fact, we're even contributing and working with them. Uh, on that solution. So I think, again, you know, at the end of the day, uh, we need to provide our customers with options. And if, so long as customers do have options, ultimately, you know, I think they win. Yeah. And I, I think to just exactly where George was actually going down the, the was going to go down on this, which was also around how well supported is, is Iceberg. Because again, we hear different things around managed versus unmanaged iceberg yep. tables and things like that. And you, there was some early consternation with how Snowflake was actually, you know, how, how I guess, open were they really being with that? How do you see this all playing out between the supportability? Because again, that, that interoperability where you guys like kind of live in that composable world, and we think most customers are going to end up in that composable world, that, that interoperability and how far you can manage really talks to the simplification for the end user. Yeah, absolutely. And I think customers are smart and they get smarter and smarter over time. And wherever vendors try to play games to sort of lock you into a platform, they'll discover that. And, and so again, I think it's really prioritizing, you know, genuine interoperability. Our pitch to the, to the, to the customer would be, Hey, you know, we're the only ones with a fully open stack, meaning open engine plus open file format. Uh, Snowflake, very much a closed engine, now supporting an open format. And even Databricks, which originated from Spark, which is an open source project, their SQL engine is Photon, and that is closed source. So again, you have two closed source engines uh, with their own, uh, I guess I'll say, biases towards how they want that data to be stored. Uh, by contrast, I think, again, within the Iceberg community, Trino is widely deployed as a open engine for an open format. And so, you know, that's what we think at least gives us credibility to customers. And I think like, you know, being able to, to say authentically to a customer that you truly are not locked in here and you have interoperability is, is, is what customers value. 
Do you think that um, customers um, started out with these, you know, a choice of, uh, well, really standardizing on, on on first two data platforms, you know, we've talked about for different workloads, Databricks and Snowflake, but now are they are they trying to find a a, a single source of truth to to standardize the governance of the the metadata? Um, because that seems to be like, you know, a, a big challenge in terms of complexity, like how you're going to, what is your source of truth and how you manage it? Yes. No, I think that's exactly true. And and that's where, you know, I think the catalog discussion becomes very uh, timely and appropriate uh, in terms of where we are in this shift towards really, you know, open data platforms. Uh, and, and I think, you know, directionally, that's where the market wants to move. And sorting that out is really important. And again, I think like for us, we'll have a solution to that that makes that easy. And customers will always have that choice with us. You know, do I want something that's fully easy, uh, like just easy button, you know, takes care of things? Uh, or do I want to do it entirely, you know, with the open source? And at least with us, they'll always have that choice uh, because again, you know, we support both. Okay. So that's, that's the historical choice, which is give me easy all in one and I'll pay extra for the, you know, CapEx and OpEx yep. or give me choice, you know, and I can do some uh, cost optimization, but it's going to have a little bit of a tax on it. Okay. That's right. Yep. Have, um, I guess from that and, and kind of just following up on the catalog thing, because you brought up, uh, you know, uh, how you were working uh, with the open source that had been the Polaris stuff that uh, Snowflake had shipped. Obviously, it was like the war, the two weeks in a row war of open sourcing our catalogs uh, over yep. the summer as well with Unity. How do, how do you see that all shaking out? Because I, I think, again, you know, some, there's been some consternation on how open source really is Unity. Yep. versus Polaris. And, you know, we see others who are like, yeah, we don't care. It, it's, we'll work across all these, similar to what you're saying. It doesn't matter, I, I guess, at the end of the day. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I think it does matter, again, back to the point of interoperability. So, you know, if we look at kind of the history of, of these two spaces, I mean, historic, or these two vendors, historically, Snowflake was the entirely proprietary closed source solution. And Databricks had that ability to say, hey, we, we like a lake, we like open formats. Um, but the truth is on the Databricks side, it, it's useful to recall Delta was not open originally. It was actually also closed source. Unity was not open originally. It was also closed source. So, um, you know, they've only opened these things sort of when the, when the customers made them do it. And, you know, have they really fully opened it? Uh, and, and that's where I, I think it gets a little tricky because they are really the only contributors to those platforms, to those products, to those, those, those components. Whereas what's interesting, I think with Polaris is Snowflake has taken actually a very different approach to, to where they've come from and said, you know what, we're actually going to make this community run project can be part of the Apache foundation. Like this is, this is going to be really actually open source. Uh, and, and that's a big deal. I think there's even, you know, important differences between the Apache software foundation and the Linux foundation in terms of, how truly open, uh, you know, projects are governed. So Snowflake has sort of rotated all the way to the more open side here, at least as the catalog is concerned. And we think that's great. We think, again, that's going to be good for, for customers. And we're seeing not only ourselves, but other vendors in the space also taking serious looks at Laris for that reason, that it is genuinely open. So al along those lines, so it, if if this catalog really becomes the, the source of truth, um, it's also the, it's also the, the platform and metadata around which all the tools for supporting the different personas and their workloads build, and so Polaris is very you know limited right now. It's just technical metadata. Unity, you know, it's not open source like um, Databricks originally claimed it. As uh, as uh, Snowflake, um, as Benoit went and looked inside the Git repository, there's only like four thousand lines that's open source. Um, <laughs> the but but still all the databricks tools build on the lineage and the the quality and all that other metadata that's exposed in unity now um my question is like how do we get a um a set of tools that customers can use that 
that work off the same metadata? Like, what do we have to do so that there's, you know, if it's not just having having um, open source for some workloads um, and choice, but it's like it's having um, interoperability with the same source of truth so that they can have different tools working off that same metadata. Yeah, absolutely. I think this is where customers are going to lead the way uh, in terms of how they deploy these platforms. And and I think you're absolutely right. And and to me, that's what gives Polaris promise. But, you know, like within a, a very specific AWS ecosystem, you know, Glue Catalog performs this function for a lot of customers, right? Um, so, you know, if you're an AWS customer, maybe Glue is your answer. But I think, uh, you know, for everybody else, uh, Polaris is definitely interesting. And and I think, you know, that's at least the vision a lot of us have for it is to provide that uh, that interoperability and be that single source of truth, as you described. So, all right. So tell us where you're being pulled in by customers for what what type of workloads are the the primary ones? Like we understand that, you know, there's the simple all in one folks that, you know, want to buy it and can or will pay up for it because they might have a smaller team to support Um but so what are the workloads and what are the price performance differences they're encountering when they when they bring in um, Starburst? Yeah. So, you know, back to, to the earlier point, if you're standardizing it on, on an open format, now you have the ability to have your engines compete. And if engines are competing, you're going to you're going to win as the customer. And that's where, you know, we've seen uh, significant reductions in in uh, TCO uh, where you know, on average, a customer is going to save at, at least 50%, uh, in some cases, 70% on their bill, you know, relating to a, a traditional cloud data warehouse. And so that's significant. And the beauty here is you don't necessarily have to rip and replace your cloud data warehouse. You don't have to move everything in one file swoop. You can actually just move some workloads. Maybe you work, you move your ETL workloads, you move your uh, longer running, you know, more complex analytics, uh, maybe certain applications. Maybe you're building a new data application. We see this all the time with our customers, where they're building a new data-driven app, and they're thinking, you know, okay, uh, I should probably have the underlying data in an iceberg format and build that in a lake. And how am I going to get, you know, warehouse-like performance in the lake? And they'll they'll you know benchmark these various engines. So we feel very confident again in the technology, both in terms of where it originated, how it's used at scale today. I was just talking to a customer uh, recently that, you know, is ingesting 50 petabytes a year uh, into iceberg tables using our streaming ingest feature that, that I uh, was referencing. So, uh, you know, those are those are all great applications. I think what people know us for in historically is the fast running interactive SQL analytics. Uh, but the engine has really expanded now to support even longer running, you know, batch jobs, ETL jobs, DBT transformations, uh, pretty wide range of analytical processing activities. And you can benchmark it relative to Snowflake and Databricks on a wide variety of those types of workloads. So it sounds like um, from um, um, an accessibility point of view, it's the front end of the pipeline where, you, where it's going to be um, ingested and, and transformed in iceberg, um, open iceberg formats, rather than pulling something out that was in Snowflake, um, maybe managed iceberg, and then you'd have to export it into some, um, into the open iceberg format where where another catalog could get at it. So it's really the left side of the, the pipeline. That's right. That's exactly right. So yeah, I, I think as you were saying there, because one of the things that it, it's very interesting in, in the research that we have uh, with ETR that we did over the summer as well, where we went out to 100 snow, joint Snowflake and Databricks customers to kind of get their feelings about things. It was very interesting. Uh, about three quarters or two thirds of the group uh, really leaned in heavy on security, privacy, and governance with 86% really that they don't do anything without having privacy and security figured out and 70% of them uh, saying that governance really was the next big piece of it. With analytics and the different workloads, how do you see people, you know, the different personas? Because the use case differs. And so with analytics a lot, if you're a retailer and you're doing first-party data collection, obviously there's a ton of PII. And so that 
data where you may be doing a recommendations engine that then goes and optimizes what they see first on the page, on the website, or on the app, mobile app becomes a very interesting use case because there's a lot of really critical data underneath the hood there that has to really, to your point, uh, interact very quickly to be able to make those changes and make that intelligence. How are you seeing the like kind of the need for governance, the need for security and privacy driving a lot of those conversations when you're out there? Yeah, it very much is. And I would say particularly so with the large enterprise segment who has that uh, challenge of data silos, data distributed across multiple systems, but also multiple geographies, which have their own privacy and data sovereignty concerns. And so that's where, you know, our ability to actually federate queries to other data sources sets us very much apart from those other uh, warehouse and lakehouse uh, providers that we were discussing, where you can actually join a table in maybe a Teradata data warehouse, for example, with the table sitting in your data lake. And you can actually do that join in Starburst and get the results of that. So you have a lot of flexibility. Also applying, of course, fine-grained access controls as you do that. So you can ensure that that PII data, which uh, perhaps originated in Switzerland, never leaves Switzerland because uh, that would violate, you know, their their own privacy and sovereignty laws. So, uh, so we work with a lot of the largest banks, largest retailers, uh, large healthcare companies that uh, are very sensitive to these types of things. And you know, the other thing I'll mention, which makes us a bit different from other players in this space, is we also run on prep. So you have that that option where you can actually access data in existing data centers. And in fact, earlier this year. We launched a partnership with Dell. Uh, they announced uh, a new appliance that's called the Dell Data Lake House, which is powered by Starburst. And it's Dell object storage plus Starburst software inside. And that can be essentially a data lake, an on-prem data lake replacement. Uh, and so I, again, I think if you're a large enterprise, you likely have on-prem and cloud. And we think the future is going to be hybrid for those types of customers. And and honestly, the, the, the new sort of uh, focus on AI workloads is, is only going to drive probably more interest in hybrid uh, style deployments. Yeah. No, I, I think to, to that point, in fact, uh, was with Teradata, I think it was last week or the week before, talking about how they're supporting Iceberg and really leaning in on this because they realize that people aren't moving the data out per se out of Teradata, but they want to join it and federate it, which brings up, you know, kind of, the second part to the to the question, and you kind of answered it, but uh, I'll, I'll let you double down on it. <laughs> really, what we're seeing is obviously it, it, there is a lot of federation as to solve a lot of these questions. Are you seeing that the management of that and the governance of that is being kind of decentralized and federated versus people trying to say, you know what, I want to put a monolithic product in that's going to do all of this for me out of that? Yeah. Within the large enterprise, absolutely. Again, I think there's probably a little bit of difference here uh, from a segmentation perspective, or maybe a smaller customer uh, would centralize because maybe they they have the benefit of no historical data architecture to speak of. They're building something from scratch. Their data volumes and their organizational complexity is relatively low. So I, I don't want to say that everybody is always going to decentralize, but I certainly do think that among the large enterprise, the complex enterprise, you know, again, multinational corporations, the Fortune 500, uh, yes, I think federated models are key. And one of the things that we've done just to make this a little bit easier, again, for those end personas you described, is uh, the creation of what we call data products. And these are effectively views of your data that can essentially abstract away and hide where that data ultimately lives and originates. And so you have the ability to look at a, a, a cohesive uh, data product and interact with that with your BI tool or SQL uh, application uh, without having to even be aware of where that data ultimately came from. And again, that's all governed as well. So uh, the data product that I see may have different rows and columns than the data product that you see based on, on your access control uh, privileges. So that's very popular, again, especially with some of those larger customers. Hey, picking up on that, um, Justin, how do how do the personas that are working with the data products, how is their experience going to change over time as these data products become, you know, fully abstracted from what's what's going on behind? It's almost like 
semantic data products. I don't know if you saw what Salesforce showed at Dreamforce, but you know they're built on the the open source version of of your technology. That's right. Their data cloud, and but now they've built you know they've they've generalized the semantic layer from from Tableau, and that the, their data products are semantic data products now, so that you know business a business user can can really work with them. I'm wondering, you know, do you see do you see the sort of the open source community moving in that direction and what might that mean for business users working with data products? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think we probably have similar visions there actually to to what Salesforce and Data Cloud is is doing with uh, one important difference, which is of course there is very Salesforce centric uh, where their data is sort of the center of that that universe. And we're trying to bring a similar you know vision to enterprise customers that have all kinds of data, not just uh, CRM data. But uh, a lot of the concepts are, are very similar. I think that's that's sort of the holy grail for for customers, and particularly in terms of being able to democratize access, which which is really what everybody wants to do. You want your newly minted MBA to be able to interact with a data product and and create some really good business decisions uh, out of that uh, without having to know all the all the semantics and understand you know how how every table is is laid out uh, across multiple data sources. So. I think directionally, that's exactly you know where we see customers wanting to go. Okay, so one other, Rob, did you want to? You, you look like you were about to jump. No, I'm, I'm, I, I, we can. I'm. Floor is yours. Okay, so you know, just on a on a on one of the last topics that we wanted to touch on was we had George Frazier, the founder and CEO of Five Trend, on on the breaking analysis recently. And he was elaborating on the theme that DuckDB had been um, talking about really for the last year, which is that big data is dead. And the CEO of, of DuckDB had been the head of product at BigQuery, and they did some analysis on most BigQuery you know, queries are single node. And then uh, Snowflake and Redshift had pu published similar data. I mean, not really meaning to make this point. Mm -hmm. um, and it's it really seems so counterintuitive because you had made this point early um, on the podcast, which was customers don't want their their data budgets to to grow faster than their revenue, and you know it seems like we're instrumenting more and more things. So help square this circle where you know some of these queries are single node, some significant measurable amount, at least as as some of the vendors are seeing it. And yet we're, we're getting greater and greater volumes of data. Help us understand that. Yeah, absolutely. So a couple of thoughts on that. Um, first of all, I think, again, sort of back to the market segmentation uh, idea, I think Fivetran does very well in sort of the, the small to, to mid-market uh, customer where they probably do see a lot of single node uh, Snowflake database systems. So I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with, uh, you know, George's observation, but... Having said that, I, I think there are two important uh, points there. Uh, number one, for the large enterprise, um, big data is just a state of life. Uh, but number two, even for that more smaller mid-market customer, their data volumes are growing. And, uh, and, and you know, for example, I was just speaking with uh, the CEO of a company called Going, uh, which is a, a travel company, uh, which is more in that, you know, mid-market segment, uh, but has... Uh, you know, 60 gigabits per second of, of data streaming in and is managing, you know, petabytes of data on an annual basis to provide the best possible travel deals. Uh, that's a case where even though they're a smaller company, they're not, you know, the size of Coca-Cola, uh, they do uh, have actually significant data and those data volumes continue to grow. The, the, the most important point, though, that I would make is whether your data is big or small, uh, you can still leverage data lakes, and that's going to really unlock you and give you the freedom to uh, improve your own cost performance. And I think this idea of Snowflake or your cloud data warehouse becoming too expensive is a concept that customers, big and small, can can relate to. It's a it's a real pain point uh, in in the market today. In fact, there are a number of little startups now that are uh, exist solely to help you try to manage your Snowflake costs better, right? Uh, which is, I think, is a, a reflection of that pain point. So it, it's never too early to to go in the direction of a data lake, from my standpoint. 
um, particularly if you see data being critical to your business and growing and scaling exponentially over time. Yeah, I, okay. I, I think that that to me is is actually a critical thing because, like you were saying, uh, it really is the use case. Having you know, when I was at Amazon and I had uh, visibility into Redshift and some of the customers that were using Redshift, you would see that there was. Uh, I won't go into particulars of one, but they literally had, uh, I think it was around fifteen clusters of Redshift and each cluster was a minimum of like eight nodes uh, mm -hmm. of, of Redshift. And we're, you know, looking at how they grow because of the data they were using in there and what the use case for that data was, you know, they were connect, they were looking to connect data from a particular cluster to another cluster of another size. And when I was at Snowplow, uh, I, I agree with George's view that when you were looking at analytics and first party data, very, very often it was in a single node uh, situation where you're going into analytics and it's similar to what Fivetran does and bringing the data together. So that doesn't surprise me. But I guess the question, because I, I don't think big data is dead at, at all, I think it's more about uh, avoiding islands of automation and islands of silos of data is are you seeing that organizations again to your point about hey the the dell announcement you know for the dell data lake powered by you know uh by uh wow i almost said snowplow but sorry for my <laughs> starburst you know but uh you know is is that what you're seeing is you know starburst is seeing that it's it's not about all of the data being per se accessible through starburst it's hey we have use case you go in you land and expand on use cases i would assume in your customers you land hey this is the use case we're brought in for we're connecting up the data from these different operational data stores or analytic data stores and bringing that together to solve x problem and then they say hey this is really easy we don't have to you know try to you know this becomes our composable data lake and move on and they keep growing in that way yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think at the end of the day, economics drives a lot of behavior in enterprise customers and the economics, you know, sort of dictate uh, open formats, data lakes, commodity storage, open compute engines. Um, you know, I, I think CIOs and CTOs who oversee these platforms uh, are getting a degree in economics here as their, their cloud data warehouses you know, spiral out of control from a cost perspective. And, 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 and so again, I think all of these things lead to the same destination, which is um, store as much data as you can in a data lake to get the lowest total cost. And then, you know, you're likely to always have some element of data that lives outside of that. And that's precisely the type of solution that we aim to provide, you know, a high performance, low cost engine for your lake with the ability to federate to the other data sources that live outside of that lake. That was my last question. Justin, which is, are you the technology that allows customers to integrate all those federated data sources that otherwise they could not really reasonably bring into one central, you know, location? Yes. I think the key thing is we want to anchor on the lake because that's where we can drive tremendous cost savings. So we would say deploy us on the lake, use us as the lake engine, and then absolutely to answer your question, we can reach out to everything outside of the lake. So kind of think of a lake centric strategy and you know we're your lake plus plus uh, solution uh, to those other data sources. Okay, great. Yeah, um, why don't you bring us home? I was gonna say, yeah, in, in, in our data with ETR, we actually looked at what else, what other data uh, platforms did they have on, on premise or in the cloud uh, all of them had at least another, actually over 30% at least had another uh, cloud data warehouse, be it Mongo or Couchbase or what have you, or Oracle for that matter, both cloud and on-prem, but 51% had Microsoft SQL. Do you see a lot of people looking to join their cloud data, uh, data presence, data warehouse, data lake with things like SQL because they it's still the system of record on-prem for certain applications that they've built and they're kind of legacy and they're not really moving them that fast? Absolutely, yeah. SQL Server is incredibly popular. It's everywhere within enterprise customers. 
And absolutely, uh, you know, SQL Server, Postgres, MySQL, these are all super, super common. Uh, just as, you know, um, customers have deployed these in, in large numbers all over the place. And and you're right, like, they're not going to retire every single one of those um, anytime soon, anyhow. Uh, so being able to join, again, a table in some SQL Server database with uh, maybe iceberg tables in your lake, I think is a very important and valuable uh, capability. Yep. No, I, I think that's a great place to leave it at. I, I really appreciate you coming on board, Justin. And George, thanks for having me on. Uh, you know, this is something I love to geek out on uh, with you because it's uh, definitely a deep topic. Thanks, Rob. It's always great to, to, to partner with you on, on uh, any of our uh, research. Yeah. So, Justin, take care and, uh, you know, we'll see you soon. And uh, thanks for being on. Thank you both. Take care. And thank you for watching this episode of George's Road to Intelligent Data Apps on the Cube, the leader in tech news and analysis. Stay tuned for more deep dives into this road and how we're going to really see these intelligent data apps grow over time. Thanks. See you soon.